In the wake of the absurd, frightening, and ultimately deadly assault on the U.S. Capitol, Democrats are looking for punishment that acknowledges what Donald Trump said led to what they did. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. We will prove with overwhelming evidence that President Trump is singularly and directly responsible for inciting the assault on the Capitol. But what Democrats seem to want to happen probably won't. In the history of the U.S., only four times has a president faced a Senate impeachment trial. Two of those trials were about Donald Trump. He was acquitted just a little over a year ago, and now he's expected to be acquitted again. There just isn't the math for a two-thirds majority needed to convict. Besides, he is, of course, now a former president. So what is the point? Will battling for the principle pay off or simply turn Trump into a political martyr emboldened by it all? And so to cut through the bombast and the process of the start of Trump's second Senate impeachment trial, let's bring in Kelly Jane Torrance, a conservative and a Canadian who sits on the editorial board of the New York Post, and Krishomara Vignaraja, a former Obama administration official. So thank you for joining us both tonight. Uh, we, we always need your insights. And Kelly Jane, let's start with you, because it seems pretty clear there will not be the math, the two-thirds majority math to convict Trump. So what are Republicans saying about what the effects of this process will be on him? Yeah, it's a great question, Adrian. because, uh, yeah, it's clear. It was, we saw today um, only six Republicans voted with Democrats to agree that it was constitutional to impeach our former president. So uh, Democrats have, would have a lot of work. They would have to uh, have at least 11 Republican senators think that it's unconstitutional, but vote for impeachment anyway. So it's not going to happen. And I think that, you know, people are wondering what if this was a wise move. Are there not some Republicans, though, who are saying, you know, he, he may not be convicted, but this might be the end of his political career? I think most Republicans, uh, you know, maybe not most, but a lot of Republicans, especially uh, those in Congress, thought that Donald Trump's political career ended really on January 6th. Most people think, uh, even Republicans, that Donald Trump created the conditions for that kind of disaster to happen with his talk for over a month of a supposed stolen election. And uh, given what happened January 6th, I think that a lot of Republicans see his career as over. Okay, so Krish, so if at the end of the day this does, you know, mark the end of Trump's personal political career, in a way has that not accomplished what Democrats were ultimately looking for? I don't think so. Um, I really don't think that this is about politics. Um, you know, when President Trump left office, he left with the lowest approval ratings of any president. Um, and I agree with the statement that on January 6th, um, he less, lo lost any prospect of uh, getting elected to political office again. Um, but this isn't about politics. This is about accountability. This is about inciting a mob that intended to take over Congress, endangering the lives of political leaders. And so until there is accountability, I don't think that this is over. This is a, a process about Donald Trump, but without him. You know, he won't testify. He's banned from his beloved social media platforms. Kelly, what is the effect of that on him and, and his base? Yeah, Adrian, it's, you know, we've hardly heard from Donald Trump because he is used to talking to people directly, uh, the American people, through Facebook and Twitter, which have banned him. Uh, the only thing I've seen come out from Donald Trump recently, of course, was his letter um, resigning from the Screen Actors Guild, which was sort of classic uh, Trump in, in its hilarity. But we're really not seeing much of him. And without that voice, uh, I think he really goes into the wilderness. And in fact, if Democrats weren't impeaching him right now or weren't putting him on trial, uh, we would be talking a lot more, I think, about what President Biden wants to do about this terrible economy, about the pandemic that's still going on. It's interesting to me that, uh, you know, Donald Trump, I really think, would, would start to become a memory, if not for this impeachment trial. So we want to play a, a clip here of one of Trump's lawyers, uh, Bruce Castor. Have a listen, then we'll have a chat. They're smart enough to pick a new administration if they don't like the old one. And they just did. And he's down there at Pennsylvania Avenue now, probably wondering how come none of my stuff is happening up at the Capitol. So, Chris, I, I suppose on the face of it, for some people, he, he's not wrong. How does that argument sit with you? 
Yeah, I mean, this idea that the election results were enough, I think, is insufficient because the election results weren't enough, right? They were not enough to stop him. Um, the decisive victory in the necessary states was not enough to stop him from the incendiary language he used. And so this is where, when we are talking about seven dead, 150 injured, political leaders cowering in corners because they believe that their lives were in danger, there has to be accountability. And so this is where I think that this argument that the election results were sufficient, it, it doesn't actually reflect the reality of what we're talking about. And Kelly Jane, if we can talk about the Republican Party for a moment here, what kind of spot are Republican senators in right now? And I'm curious about the pressures on them, especially the young ones who have, you know, hopes to have long political careers. Well, that's an interesting question, because in some ways, uh, especially if they're very ambitious and they're interested in a presidential run in 2024, you might think that they would have the incentive to actually bar Trump from being able to run for that office. But I think they know that most Americans, uh, most Republicans, uh, don't think that this impeachment is uh, is anything more than politics. So, uh, you know, there's a, you could notice that most of the uh, Republicans who voted that this is constitutional today, they are those moderates who often uh, break from their party on certain votes, like Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, or people who aren't running again, like Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania. Uh, those that are still running, Trump is still something of a force in the party. Uh, most Republicans, uh, your average voter, uh, supports Trump. Uh, he actually got more Republican votes in 2020 than he did in 2016. I think that signals that there is a divide and it's not going to be an easy one. It's not obviously the Trump faction is winning, mm -hmm. the anti-Trump faction is winning. Okay, Chris, last word to you. What, what worries you right now about how all of this is being handled? Yeah, I mean, we've not seen a siege on our capital um, since 1814. Um, you know, this is not something that is supposed to happen in the Western Hemisphere. And yet we saw this happen on January 6th. And the fact that we see more accountability by private individuals like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg than we have seen from our political leaders is disconcerting. This is not a conventional situation, right? We've never had a president of the United States incite a mob to take siege of the Capitol. And so this is where I hope um, in the next couple of days, we will see senators um, who listen intently, but these are senators who were not just uh, jurors in the conventional sense, they are witnesses, they are victims. And so I think it'll be interesting to see what we see as the questions they ask following those arguments made um, by both sides. All right, thank you. Krishamara Vignaraja, Kelly Jane Torrance, as always, thank you. Thank you.